Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Daisuke. Uh, I'm an AI entrepreneur in Tokyo. I'm uh, running a hackathon community with uh, for the Python machine learning with 8,000 members. And, uh, this time we are working on a book about uh, how AI can beat COVID-19. Uh, uh, three members from University of Tokyo, they are uh, medical entrepreneurs, researchers, uh, so uh, we will be publishing the book in uh, February, and then this interview will be the special contents in this book. Thank you very much for help. Okay, uh, sounds good to me. Yeah, okay. And then uh, I think I'm allowed to record this interview according to Zach-san, so may I start? Yes, of course. Uh, we, will, we will have the shared recording on the Skype side. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, just for your benefit, uh, once you start a local recording, I will also do a local recording, so it's higher quality for you afterwards. And I'll send it to you also on Skype. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start recording. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So this is not recorded. Uh, let me just double check. Yes, this is recorded. Okay. Uh, I plan to uh, do this interview for 40, 45 minutes. Uh, is it good for you? Yes, of course. And usually we will publish the video if you're okay with it to our YouTube channel. But if uh, you think a transcript is preferred, we can also do a transcript uh, instead of the video to publish. Wow, fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, so uh, our book title is How Can AI Beat Coronavirus? Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for your time. So this time as a preparation, I talked with uh, as many uh, Taiwanese as possible. And then uh, these voices from them reflect a strong point of your, your strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, example, my Taiwanese friend, back-end engineer, female entrepreneur, ex-Googler, mm -hmm. manufacturer, GovZero members. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I prepared uh, nine, nine questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, as of October 2020, uh, many Japanese companies are suffering from bad economy after pandemic. Uh, my strategy is preparing as a pessimist and act as an optimist. So what is your advice or encouragement for Japanese business people and citizens? What mentality should we have like smart person like you? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there is a saying I often quote from Leonard Cohen, and I quote, there is a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in, unquote. Um, the idea is that on a common issue like COVID, uh, it both, of course, separates people because of social distancing and so on, but it also connects people like never before. Like previously, before the coronavirus pandemic, we will probably not be having this conversation. And this book probably will not be published uh, because the uh, idea around AI uh, before the coronavirus is definitely not specializing in the humanitarian part of AI. People think about transhumanism uh, and people spend a lot of time on vanity project. I say this without judgment, but uh, by making people look like better than other people and so on. And nowadays, these aesthetics are uh, no longer the norm. We don't see people showing off on Instagram or on social media anymore because we understand that there are much more pressing issues to be solved and we need to direct our energy to it. Um, and so I think the main idea is here about the common good. If we have the common good in mind, then it makes it easier for us to find the common projects that we can all contribute on. But if we think more individualistically, uh, like raising my status above other people and so on, that will be detrimental in the time of coronavirus. Okay, well, this is a wonderful ins insight. And, uh, do you mean uh, more, uh, I guess, a company with social mission has an opportunity to grow their business and then uh, this non-social company should shift to the social direction in this uh, in this pandemic? Well, in the pandemic, for example, we see that many companies are forced to adopt teleworking 
But teleworking is not just a neutral technology, right? It also connects people more intimately. Uh, it allows people to spend more time with the people they care uh, in their locality. It also makes for a more diverse and inclusive uh, workforce. Uh, if, of course, you have broadband as human right, otherwise it excludes people also. So uh, any new uh, COVID strategies um, has this light side of people who previously were unable to accept a more socially flexible arrangement like telework are often forced to accept it. But even after the pandemic goes away, like in Taiwan, it's been five months uh, with no local cases. Still, we use telework whenever appropriate because people have already have a good experience with teleworking as compared to maybe 10 or uh, you know 15 years ago when teleworking was not very practical and the connection quality uh, doesn't work at all. But nowadays, you, you know, you can see and hear me just fine, I can hear you just fine, and this makes teleworking a modern reality. So it doesn't have to be social purpose, but we do have to evaluate the social or more pro-social um, consequences of the ways that we have changed uh, in uh, working together. And organizational changes are also a kind of technology, right? Teleworking is a social innovation. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, I checked to several of your keynote speech, and then you mentioned several times you were mentioning about being robust is important mm -hmm. in, a, in a society mm -hmm. and business. So in in the COVID nineteen, the, all the business need to be more robust. Mm -hmm. For example, some of the restaurant owners opening the only the kitchen in the tenth floor of the building, mm -hmm. and then doing doing using the sales channel. Mm -hmm. uh, only over Uber Eats. Yes. So this kind of a uh, you know small expense business is a more robust than big expense business. So what do you think about this kind of uh, being, mm -hmm. being more robust? Yeah, definitely. If you anticipated this need uh, and already work this way, of course you're robust. But even if you do not anticipate and take a hit uh, when the new coronavirus came, then if you can very quickly innovate and pivot to a way that works with uh, the new situation, then you're maybe not as robust uh, as others, but you're resilient. Uh, and I think resilience uh, is a shared value too, especially uh, around like uh, island countries such as uh, Japan and Taiwan, because we understand there are some uh, like disasters like earthquake or typhoon that simply cannot be managed. Uh, management doesn't work as a term against such a natural disaster, but we can be resilient in the sense of not only minimizing the damage, but also goes uh, around the post um, tsunami, the post earthquake situations as a whole society. So while robust is more about a single individual or an organization, I think resilience is part of the culture it's the entire society. These two work very closely together. Yes. Yeah, this is a very valuable uh, insight and advice. Thank you very much. My second question about myself. Uh, I and my wife got COVID-19 and were in the hospital for three weeks in April. Uh, that was a huge setback for us. But uh, now, as a str uh, strangely, we feel uh, somehow thankful for COVID because I'm a South startup founder. COVID made me much stronger, bolder, and smarter person. So, in, uh, for example, in biology, virus is somehow necessary uh, for creatures' evolutions. So, in my opinion, how can we leverage COVID as an opportunity to become a person or a stronger person or a better society or a stronger society? Yeah, uh, first of all, congratulations on your recovery. Uh, and also, I think COVID uh, shows uh, that it is actually possible to live in a way that is sustainable. In many places where there's a lot of air pollution, a lot of water pollution and so on, because of COVID, people have seen a clear sky for the first time. People have seen the clean water for the first time because those structural um, issues around the environment were simply neglected and especially for younger people, maybe for their entire life, they have seen the water and the air and the environment as a kind of damaged uh, vision. But uh, with the COVID comes the opportunity to see the natural habitat again, as lively as it is. And you can't unsee it, you can't go back, uh, right? Once people understand that it is actually possible through teleworking and through actually Uber Eats, uh, as you mentioned, it is possible to reduce our overall footprint on the environment, live much more sustainable 
deeply. And I think that is also a much um, needed way for the society to feel better, even after COVID, uh, and recover in a resilient and sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is uh, from uh, my Taiwanese female startup founder. Mm -hmm. She said uh, you are uh, representing Taiwanese multiple freedom mm -hmm. as an icon, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Japan is a single ethnic country over thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, this kind of paying attention to the details, culture, created a Toyota's very efficient car manufacturing system, etc., which is what's great. But sometimes this lack of diversity blocks Japan from growth or innovations. So under pandemic and global business competition, diversity is very, very important. So how can Japan uh, implement the essence of diversity into our single ethnic country? What is the right balance be between uh, you know, a single way of thinking or diversity? And then how can we learn from Taiwan regarding diversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think diversity is not just about ethnic, though. Uh, in Taiwan, of course, our ethnic composition is fairly uniform, uh, but our cultural composition is very diverse, right? Uh, even for people who identify as ethnic Han, uh, there are uh, the Taiwanese Holok language, the Taiwanese Hakka language, with at least six different sub-languages, and also, of course, Mandarin, but uh, also spoken in different ways. So um, that's at least three different uh, languages. And add to that, the National Languages Act uh, recognizes the indigenous languages and also the sign language as the national language. So in our live streamed uh, Central Epidemic Command Center uh, press conferences, you actually see people uh, sign a lot uh, and learn about sign language vocabularies and so on. So first of all, I, I don't think it's only because I'm ethnically uh, belonging to some group of people, it would prevent me from learning new cultures and new languages. Uh, just like uh, maybe you work in AI, so your native language is probably Python, uh, but it doesn't stop you from learning, say, JavaScript or Rust or Go or some other languages. The more languages you learn, the more transcultural you become. You will be able to see the same problem uh, from the objective oriented fashion, from a functional fashion, from a declarative fashion, and so on. And that makes you a better programmer, uh, definitely, than if you only know one language. Uh, and so I think this transcultural attitude is more important than ethnic diversity. Ethnic diversity and inclusion is, of course, very good. But without this transcultural idea of intersectionality, it is uh, simply just one dimension of a multidimensional uh, human being. right? And so I think intersectionality is more important than ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And my next question is, uh, my, according to my Taiwanese friends, uh, you never showed anger mm -hmm. or you, you are always calm. Mm -hmm. and having the mindfulness is, and being calm mindset mm -hmm. is very important under the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Especially social media was chaos in this mm -hmm. time. And uh, which kind of three mindsets should we have to be the mm -hmm. partner like you? Yeah, uh, first of all, I turn off all the notifications. I always work in the do not disturb mode. So I will not, uh, for example, my phone will not go bing when we're having this conversation. <laughs> and this is important to be distraction free. Uh, and the second thing is I limit my social media or indeed checking my inbox uh, only once per half an hour. So I focus for 25 minutes and then I check social media or email for five minutes. It's called the Pomodoro method that also helps a lot. And thirdly, I think it's important to have sufficient amount of sleep every night. I sleep on average eight hours every night. Uh, if you have sufficient amount of sleep, then most of the short term memory uh, you uh, gather the previous day will uh, be written into long term memory. But if you have a very short amount of sleep, then that's writing to the long-term memory is not yet done. Uh, and so you will live uh, the other day with a lot of thoughts from the previous day still uh, in mind. And that interferes, is kind of an internal distraction. And so having sufficient sleep also very important. Okay, uh, similarly, I used to work in Italy, so mm -hmm. they are very opt optimistic about mm -hmm. the way of thinking. And then uh, recently, some of the celebrities committed suicide in Japan mm -hmm. and suiciding late. It was mm. like a 15% increase 
last mm. month in Japan. So people are like uh, getting pressure from the pandemic about the economy. So, uh, well, similarly, but how can we maintain this optimistic mindset that in mm -hmm. the pandemic? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be optimistic. If you feel um, depressed, uh, that is also a good time to reflect, to do some long-term thinking, to uh, make sure that you don't miss uh, some threads that could be missed when you're uh, much more active, right? So uh, it's like uh, the time and tide. Uh, if you feel pessimistic, it's good for long-term strategizing. If you feel optimistic, it's good for actions. Uh, the, the trick is to make sure that the cycles uh, are in a balanced fashion, like yin and yang, uh, within the space of a day or at most a few days. Um, if you spend uh, half a year uh, being optimistic, half a year being pessimistic, mm -hmm. that's uh, much more bipolar. Uh, but uh, if you can limit that interval to at least a few days or a single day, uh, like maybe do some uh, like strategizing um, when you are going to sleep and uh, list the actions you can take when you wake up, that's of course the best rhythm. So getting a kind of internal tempo going on, I think is very important. A tempo, the speed uh, of going more active and more reactive, uh, that will tend to balance one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And then a little bit back into the previous question, but uh, well, we are Japanese uh, single ethnic country and then paying attention to details. Uh, this is really, really strength, but at the same time, uh, we overthink sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have many overthinkers. Overthinkers mm -hmm. tend to become a pessimist sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how can we overcome this mm -hmm. overthinking culture? Yeah, I think uh, that's where the Leonard Cohen quote I just quoted, uh, why it's so important. Because uh, if you overthink, if you're a perfectionist, uh, when you share the work you do, um, you know, other people may admire you, but there's really not much they can offer uh, to support or help you because you already got it so perfect. Uh, and so a little bit of imperfection. Uh, in open source, we say, and I quote, release early and release often, unquote, meaning that even if you only have an idea, Idea, even if it's very much imperfect, as long as you say so up front. Uh, and instead of pretending like this is completed work, uh, you can just say, oh, this is a stub, like in Wikipedia, this is just a stub that uh, people can grow upon. Then that's an invitation for other people to co-create. And so I think the importance of release early, re release often really balances uh, the perfectionism uh, in overthinking. If you think a little and then publish, and then think a little and then publish, uh, you can meet much more um, diverse set of people than if you think to 100% and then publish. Mm -hmm. mm, that really makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is uh, in your interview with Andrew Leonard, which happened in May 2020, uh, you were mentioning about warm power versus sharp power. Also, hashtag Taiwan can help. This is a very important concept in the uh, 21st century. So the world should shift from competition to collaboration so is warm power coming from Taiwanese culture? Or uh, since actually Taiwanese people are very, very warm to me. So how did you, uh, how did you ac accelerate it with the power of the internet? Yeah, uh, I think of course the Taiwanese people are uh, very much um, like pro-social. Uh, and the pro-socialness uh, is amplified through the internet by making sure that people work out loud. There's actually a book about it. And working out loud meaning that um, just sharing what I'm working on, like this interview, uh, is not just for the two of us or for reader of the book. Actually, we're going to publish uh, either as a video or as a transcript everything we have said. And so basically dedicating it to the commons. And by commons, we mean that people can take it and like the rap band, those monos in Japan, they maybe take whatever we have said and sample it into music. Uh, and that's fine too, right? Uh, and so the point here is that if you uh, work out loud, you can meet people who take the kind of work that you do and on the direction that you did not anticipate. And that builds uh, social relationships much more easily than if everybody have to sign a contract and pre-agree on whatever deliverable there are. Of course, there's uh, a role of contracts in the financial sense, in the business sense, but a social contract in which that people agree to 
give more into the commons than we take from the commons is also very important. And that's the underlying idea of Taiwan can help in that we are much more willing to help than we uh, take from the international community. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. Thank you very much. So in your perspective, what's our biggest impact of uh, hashtag Taiwan can help? Which, yeah. kind, of, uh -huh. which kind of things happened uh, yeah. based on this hashtag? Yeah, for example, there's a website called Taiwan can help that us. Uh, mm -hmm. And that asks who can help uh, Taiwan, Taiwan can help. And the great thing about this website is that it's not run by the government. There's zero government funding in mm -hmm. it. It's just uh, YouTubers, people who crowdfund and crowdsource the entire content. And just uh, this morning, I actually went to the uh, massive online open course, uh, the Hahao uh, channel, uh, which you can see in Taiwan Can Help That Us, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, where they recorded from our vice president at the time, Dr. Chen Jianren, uh, the uh, crash course on COVID-19, because he literally is not just a vice president at the time, but actually wrote the textbook on epidemiology. And so this idea of people pulling in useful resources, sharing it with the international community, with the English uh, dubbing and subtitle and so on, uh, signifies the idea that Taiwan Can Help is not just a government thing, but rather everybody in Taiwan can dedicate, for example, a few masks for the international humanitarian aid. You can also see that in Taiwan Can Help that us. So it shows the diversity and the cross-sectoral participation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then a uh, little sub, sub question from that uh, that answer is uh, I think I personally think uh, because I'm doing an AI AI project mm -hmm. uh, this time in a pandemic, including infodemic, uh, some people are lacking on the science thinking, like a thinking mm. scientist, mm. And, and got panicked uh, from the uh, false information or uh, biased information. Mm. You know, media or television or newspaper mm -hmm. or something else in the town. Yes. So uh, science thinking is getting becoming more important now, mm -hmm. now especially for uh, things like pandemic. Mm -hmm. so what do you think about it and how can we improve this science? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think the scientific method uh, is something that people can practice. It is not just uh, a abstract uh, idea that you just learn about in school and then uh, throw away. It's something that you can just keep uh, doing, right? Uh, the idea is simply to uh, learn about uh, a basic uh, priors or basic um, facts. Uh, and that's what the government can help, for example, with the vice president recording crash courses about coronavirus or uh, the Central Epidemic Command Center holding live press conferences every uh, 2 p.m. Uh, during the pandemic and answer all the questions from the journalist. And that gives the basic um, observations. But now, based on observations, uh, part of science thinking is you can form your own uh, hypotheses uh, mm -hmm. and through induction and through experiments you can deduce um, new ideas uh, and propose it for the community to evaluate, to replicate, basically. For example, there was uh, a person uh, named Slai Chen Yu uh, who tried uh, to use the rice cookers uh, and to disinfect the, the mask. And you can actually see the rice cooker right there. <laughs> right. Uh, and then um, basically, uh, Lai tried to uh, put the medical masks uh, in such traditional rice cookers, which unlike the newer IH cookers, uh, they don't have a ventilation uh, hole. Uh, and so that makes the uh, heating model very predictable. It will very quickly heat up to 110 Celsius and then very quickly cool down. And because of that, in the few uh, seconds where it reaches more than 100 Celsius, it kills off the virus but doesn't destroy the material of the medical mask. And so he basically uh, outline the procedure of doing so and then share it with the community. Now, because the medical masks are theoretically one-time use, of course, the uh, Taiwan Food and Drug Administration is quite skeptical <laughs> of this idea that you can somehow reuse it. But then the TFDA did their own experiments and much to their credit, they invited Mr. Lai uh, to the daily press conference to mm -hmm. teach the uh, evidence of the hypothesis while the minister Chen Shizhong actually 
cooked uh, a, a medical mask in a rice cooker uh, in the front of all the people watching the live stream. So this is just one simple example, but it shows that science is something that we all participate and we can all replicate. It's not that just for a handful of scientists, everybody can be a citizen scientist. And when it comes to reusing masks, uh, these experiments are being replicated around the world. And nowadays we see from peer reviewed journals that this even works for N95 masks. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's a great, great story. And then similarly, similar question is, uh, oh, this time people got confused between the fact and the opinions. Mm -hmm. And then um, many Japanese people believe that like, uh, news is a fact, but the news can be biased mm -hmm. because of the sponsor, because of the uh, owner of the newspaper, newspaper company. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, as a scientist, scientists tend to think uh, to believe in the, you know, fact supported by the evidence. Mm -hmm. So this kind of way of thinking is uh, important, I think. But uh, what do you think about it? Well, I mean, uh, even if there's no bias in the people running the news organization, uh, the source that they collect those ideas from may be biased. And even if they use the most rigorous methods uh, like data science, um, still, um, if you have the wrong expectation of the data, then you may collect the data, but then accumulate data bias without realizing it. Mm -hmm. So there really is no escaping of bias. And what uh, people can do is like listing an ingredient in the food label to mm -hmm. list exactly what are the sources. Like in the journalism, uh, if they use a, a research paper, it helps, of course, to include the DOI number so people can fact check themselves. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing data science, it also helps to list the data sets that we actually draw our conclusions from, so our peers may evaluate independently. So I don't think any single individual can be free of bias, but what we can do is to list our sources so that other people may benefit from independent verification. That's the beauty of the scientific method. It grows with the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is uh, uh, your collaboration with the Seattle company, uh, Pulse.is. Pulse. Pulse. is very innovative. And then it is like a real time visual, visualization of the democracy. And since we run the machine learning hackathon community here in Tokyo, we are very interested in your insights. So, what did you find by data analysis in people's opinion discussion? And then that will be lead us to the next generation politics system. And then we should do the same here in Japan, I think. Yeah, we use polis from everything to, uh, you know, uh, do with uh, the open mountaineering, that's the hiking, uh, to the opening up the oceans, that's uh, like sea sports and so on, and to diplomatic conversations like with the de facto U.S. Embassy, the AIT, on the digital dialogues, and pretty much um, everything, right? There's even a uh, website, polis.gov.tw, that is our locally hosted instance, so it's very much ingrained into our institution already. Uh, and the best thing I find about Polis is that it's uh, AI in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It's not AI in the 21st century, mm -hmm. uh, what was deep learning and so on, because it's actually much harder to explain the results if you use 21st century AI. If it's just 20th century AI in Polis, it's mostly principal component analysis, mostly k-means clustering. Mm -hmm. uh, these are ideas that even for a primary schooler, if you take some time to explain through the concepts, they mm -hmm. can verify it themselves. But if you used uh, any of those cutting edge like transformer models mm -hmm. of deep learning, uh, explaining it is actually very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I think uh, it helps to build data competence, that is to say, a self-confidence in producing and um, analyzing data instead of just consuming the results of a data analysis. It's like media competence is the ability to produce media versus media literacy, which is just about viewing and reading media. Uh, it's important to start small, to start with uh, well understood techniques 
uh, like the 20th century AI, uh, and then build confidence in all the participants' uh, ability to not only replicate the results, but also do their independent analysis. And then maybe you can add some more like deep learning as a assistant, for example, um, smart categorization and so on. But these are nice to have. The core functionality, I think, must be very accountable, that's to say easy to explain, and also value aligned, meaning that uh, it serves the best interest of the person using it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the counter question about that comment is, uh, uh, I think the beauty of the power of the machine learning is uh, finding uh, counterintuitive fact. So uh, did you find any counterintuitive fact in yeah, analysis definitely. of people's opinion? Definitely. Yeah, the, the police, the main police insight, uh, which is surprising to pretty much everyone participating, is that actually people agree mostly with each other's points most of the time on most of the issues. And it's very counterintuitive because people really be to the more anti-social social media, uh, which wastes people's time just going through the ideologically charged uh, controversial issues. But in each uh, social topic, these controversial ideologies are maybe just a few points. If you uh, just say, okay, we agree to disagree, but then there's much more that we agree. For example, when UberX came to Taiwan, everybody uh, agreed on the insurance, taxation, the fairness principle, registration, and so on. And while, of course, people may differ on what constitutes a sharing economy, some people think, you know, you're not even carpooling, that's not sharing economy. But people, some people think, oh, it's sharing economy if there is a platform that does matchmaking uh, of the idle hours of cars and so on. If you get ca caught up in those ideologies, of course, the society goes nowhere. But counterintuitively, police shows that we actually agree on those rough consensus or those common values after all. So why don't we just regulate those? And then we can talk about those abstract concepts that are controversial later. Mm. Okay, so uh, do you think eventually uh, optimization of the policies can be done? On, based on the data science? Yeah, definitely. I think data science offers a very rare but uh, important glimpse, uh, which is much more holistic to the entire society. A lot of the difficulty that we have when talking about like climate change, um, disinformation crisis, COVID, whatever, is that because the problem space and solution space is so large, it's uh, very difficult to hold them in one's mind. So one would oversimplify. And once people oversimplify, but in different ways, uh, it creates ideological differences, even though their value may be the same. And so data science can give a holistic, like dimensional reduction, right? Uh, it shows a interactive uh, portrait of the actual problem space without oversimplifying two or only one or two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have any other example of the, uh, the fact you found in the, you know, police and then made it, made it as a policy? Mm -hmm. or... Yeah, definitely. So for example, um, when we did the consultation with the AIT, the de facto U.S. Embassy, on um, promoting people-to-people -people ties uh, in, um, like across the world, um, there's a very controversial statement that says, and I quote, Taiwan should make English an additional working language. Even France have done the same, unquote. And it was very controversial. People don't uh, like it, but there's also people who really like it. Uh, but the statement with the most consensus is that we need to prepare our education environment so that in due time, people will feel uh, comfortable speaking native English. Uh, and so basically it's the same statement, but uh, set in the future. Like for people who are in kindergarten, we mm -hmm. need to prepare so that um, 10 years, 15 years down the line, they feel comfortable thinking in English. And mm -hmm. now everybody agrees with that. <laughs> and so I think this is important to realize that if you set far enough to the future, uh, if you are patient enough, uh, something that looks like a, a very controversial topic may actually get everybody's support. And of course, we develop our bilingual nation strategy based on that insight. Mm -hmm. Do you think eventually data science can pick the weak voice in the society? Uh, if we design to do so, of course. Mm. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is, uh, according to Gov17, uh, your COFACT is uh, one of the most active rep repository in the GitHub. And in this platform, people can crowdsource the fact check the rumors. It can be done in 60 minutes as an average. And then this could stop uh, infodemic under COVID-19. And then how did you come up with this idea? And then how can we expand this open source plus crowdsourcing idea for other use cases and uh, eventually the other countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the COVAX team have already spread, for example, uh, to the Jurarongong University where we had a workshop. Uh, and if you remove the S uh, and go just to COFACT.org, uh, it actually goes to the Thai version uh, in pilot of the COVAX uh, repository. And so it has already already uh, seen a lot of uh, adoption uh, around the world and especially in Thailand, which is uh, very nice. Uh, but I, I cannot speak on behalf of the um, co-founder uh, Johnson Liang, uh, who really uh, goes by the nickname M M R. ORZ, Mr. ORZ, um, mm -hmm. is actually uh, the, the uh, main uh, mastermind <laughs> behind this chatbot and also the main um, contributor uh, for the first version of the COFAX. Of course, now it's a very large team. So I would uh, encourage you to uh, maybe um, ask uh, Johnson. Uh, I mean, here is his uh, GitHub uh, repository and his contact details, and maybe he can share the full story because I'm just a promoter of COFAX. Um, but I'm not uh, part of the team that started Perfex. Okay, I will definitely do so. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My next question is a little technical. Uh, sure. You are known as a programming wizard, mm -hmm. and then my Taiwanese engineer, mm -hmm. uh, who's actually working for the GitLab Taiwan, mm -hmm. and says uh, you can write 200 lines of mm -hmm. code and mm -hmm. can build amazing performance application. Mm -hmm. sure. So what, what are the top three key points when writing effective code? Well, first of all, it helps um, to write it with the community. If I write just the bare bones without design, uh, graphics, uh, favorite icons, um, and so on, but I do it in the open, and I say, I know this is, looks ugly, but send me pull requests, uh, then everybody can contribute. And that's really the, the main key point, is to work out loud uh, instead of working in isolation. Uh, the second thing also helps that you identify the project's uh, social good uh, in the very beginning. So even before you write the first line of code, think about your readme, think about your tagline, think about your project name and hashtag, uh, and how to communicate the social good of your project to any random stranger so that they will be motivated to contribute uh, to the code base. And mm -hmm. third, um, always um, instead of um, asking people to um, sign a lot of consent forms and so on before contributing, uh, just give them the capability to contribute. Uh, mm -hmm. That's radical trust. Uh, and it's always easy nowadays that you can revert their changes if it turns out their changes doesn't make sense. Uh, but um, asking for uh, uh, permission is much uh, more difficult than asking for forgiveness, right? If people uh, can just go and change uh, and say, oh, sorry, forgive me, I got it wrong, I made a typo or whatever, it's uh, no big deal. But if everybody has to ask your permission, then you become the bottleneck uh, for the project. And so by relieving yourself of the bottleneck, you can delegate away even the delegation to other people. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And then your way of using radical trust is really interesting. What's the main difference between radical trust and trust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, radical trust means that we give the right to commit. For example, when I was working on nowadays called Raku, uh, but back in the time, uh, the Pux uh, implementation, um, I give uh, commit bits, that's to say the right to push into the shared repository, uh, not only to people working on Perl and Haskell, but also um, Guido van Rusen, uh, the creator of Python, why not? Uh, and uh, even when someone, uh, you know, uh, flames, like uh, writes some uh, toxic language about uh, Perl uh, on any of the forums, uh, we often just reply saying, hey, here is a commit bit, uh, you can contribute and make it better. Uh, it even evolved so that when uh, there was a committer uh, who was just giving uh, uh, 
birth uh, to, to one of their child, uh, we immediately gave the child a commit bit too, even though uh, they're just uh, newborn. <laughs> and so basically, uh, it's like Wikipedia, right? Anyone with an IP address can change our code, and we can figure out the forgiveness later if they've made some bad changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so similarly, uh, lots of people in Japan, and maybe globally, wants to become an engineer, mm -hmm. IT engineer this time because of the maybe bad economy. IT engineer can be uh, highly paid and then work, mm -hmm. can work remotely mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the place. Mm -hmm. So do you, en do, do you have any message to encourage this kind of newbie or wannabe engineers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, in Taiwan, we don't call it so software engineering. We call it program design. Uh, and it's the same thing, but uh, it conveys a different idea. Uh, when you call it engineering, you think of someone who interacts mostly with machines. But if you call it a designer, uh, that's someone who mostly interacts with other people. Uh, and so, of course, um, a real programming work involves working with people and working with machines, of course. Uh, and whatever code you write must be readable by machines, but also readable by humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, there's two sides of this job. I'm not saying that there's only one side, but since you're talking about software engineers, I would like to encourage them to not forget about the design part. Computational thinking, scientific thinking is great, but also design thinking. Learn about how to um, explore the various different values that people have, how to define a common value out of the diversity, how to develop uh, according to various different prototypes concurrently, and how to deliver the final uh, work, and also allow other people to deliver their version of their work, and that's design thinking. Okay, thank you very much. So how can typical, uh, because for example, one of the typical backend or machine learning engineer do not learn designing, um, then how can they learn designing without mm -hmm. being a designer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, design thinking is not about being a professional designer. This is about uh, working through uh, this iterative process mm -hmm. to how to understand your fellow human beings and how to define those challenges and redefine problems and create innovative solutions. Uh, and if you can learn programming uh, by going to, I don't know, Stack Exchange or whatever uh, forum that people are having a, such a conversation, uh, I'm sure that you can also browse, for example, the uh, Interaction Design Foundation's um, mm -hmm. description about design thinking and find the references and join the communities. I mean, uh, design thinking always starts uh, with uh, a idea. And this idea is often just part of uh, your life, right? You can see something that you uh, want to see uh, done better, and then it reaches you, and uh, then you can reach to other people asking whether there are some other issues that you also want to solve in that vein. Uh, and that is the basis of interaction design, and uh, that will then teach a different lens of problem solving. So if you're interested, I just pasted the interactiondesign.org guide. Uh, you don't have to follow all the lessons, uh, but uh, that outline shows what's the learning path about design thinking. And you can start uh, from a user experience perspective, from a user interface perspective, a front-end um, perspective, a user researcher uh, perspective. There's many, many different entry points into the learning path of design thinking. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'm also a big fan of design thinking, but uh, my biggest learning today is uh, what we are saying is uh, design thinking uh, except uh, UI UX design exists in case of machine learning, in case of backend, everything can be designed. Right? Yeah, that, that's definitely the case. Uh, mechanism design, market design, service design, everything can apply the design thinking too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. My very last question is, uh, Everyone praises your achievement, mask supply application, and its data visualization. So uh, technically speaking, public API and the open data are essential to build it. So in your ICFP keynote, you said someone from Korea contacted you, but uh, they couldn't make it. Uh, they couldn't build the same application in Korea. So we do not have a pharmacy open data API either. So how can we 
can other countries, for example, government or big company proceed this open data movement? For example, example persuading big company to provide more a public API or allocating the budget to support civic tech hackathon. Yeah, uh, first of all, I was referring to early February uh, where we did the uh, API for Taiwanese uh, pharmacies. And at the time, of course, uh, the Korean uh, people do not yet uh, have the open API. But what's amazing is that Finjian Kiang uh, from Tainan City, part of the GovZero uh, Slack channel, uh, mm -hmm. shared uh, the API that he had uh, with the people in Korea. Uh, and so, for example, the Seoul City, um, quickly, well, not that quickly, but eventually around March, uh, set up such a API and followed by other cities as well. And so I think it's just a few weeks time. I think by mid-March, they do have uh, a mask availability map going in their mask uh, regime system. And I also met the developers over video conference. Some of them are just like 15 years old, uh, so it's excellent. Uh, and so what happens, I think, at that time is that uh, the Korean government were seeing that there is a need, but they do not have an example. And what the civic technologist can show is that once you use the API, then instead of coding anything from scratch, the map that Finjian Kyun made in Tainan City can immediately work also as a map for the Seoul city, even though Finjian Kyun doesn't speak Korean, but he speaks JavaScript. That's the important thing, right? Uh, and so uh, I think that enabled uh, a real collaboration. Uh, in Japan, there is a very similar story about the code for Japan, uh, mm -hmm. people who work with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, to work on the Stop COVID dashboard. And again, because they work out in the open, uh, the government also helped on the internationalization and the localization, and I personally also have translating it. So uh, as long as it's open, it's on GitHub, uh, I think it's there's no boundaries. Uh, it's not just, you know, people in Korea or people in Taiwan or people in Japan. Everybody who speaks JavaScript uh, can co-design the API, and the government basically accepts whatever uh, work is there, and then basically it's like a reverse procurement where the government only have to guarantee the stability of the API. API, but doesn't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you get any request from other countries regarding the mask application mm -hmm. of the API? Yeah, That's definitely, definitely. Uh, and many people uh, are seeing it not as something that they can just copy, uh, but rather a model like the Taiwan model, uh, where they can engage the civil society, the social sector, who do not uh, previously uh, understand that they can also make government digital services. For example, on the Stop COVID uh, dashboard in Tokyo, I think all what the Tokyo uh, people do in the metropolitan government is basically giving them a domain name that is uh, a government. But uh, the actual uh, link is still to GitHub. Uh, and the GitHub is the main place where people do the pull requests and so on. On. And that means that it's made in the world. It's just given a Tokyo Metropolitan domain name. Uh, and then, of course, it's forked into many other uh, cities as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That, that's all uh, for my questions. And then thank you very much for answering. Mm -hmm. you think? And yeah, then... sure. W would you prefer we publish the video or would you prefer if we publish uh, the transcript? Yeah, uh, could you publish the video? And okay, of course. Uh, transcription. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's awesome. So I'll just publish the video on YouTube then. Okay, yeah. I'll send you the link. Okay, okay. and then uh, my last, last, uh, yes. last, last request is, uh, may I take a picture? Like, of course, of course, you can take several pictures. All right. Just one moment. I'm not... Okay, one, two, three, smile, please. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Thank okay. you very much. I Excellent. And then Excellent. we will publish a book. And then we will promote a book uh, because uh, this time publisher is a IPO the company, public company called Show Asia. So okay. They have a sort of selling, selling power. Okay. Okay. Take care. Live long and prosperous. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.